This we'll conference will now be recorded. Okay. All right, there you go. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Pacific Hackers. My name is Rod Soto, and I'm here with uh, Marco Palacios, who is my, uh, my partner um, in InfoSec Urban as well. And today we have a, um, and we have Diane. I cannot hear you guys. Uh, yeah, let us see you. There you go. <laughs> so um, uh, today we're we're gonna we're gonna have a couple of things. The first one is introduction to ITRDC, which is a a pretty interesting organization that some of you guys may want to join. And then we're gonna have the uh, um, Bay Cyber uh, guys uh, tell their story, and hopefully uh, we will conclude with uh, plans and strategies of what we're gonna do next. Uh, as DEFCON is approaching. So with that said, uh, I'm going to pass it up to uh, Marco. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, everyone. Uh, nice seeing you guys. Um, so today we have a, a fantastic, uh, you know, presenter, uh, Roger, uh, with ITDRC. Uh, Roger and I, we work in the same company, uh, Forinet. And, uh, um, you know, we know each other since basically since we started, it, you know, it's definitely a, a very good person, very knowledgeable person that I, I can go to for anything. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I've been trying to help him out with uh, recruitment and ITDRC. I think this organization is awesome. And uh, I, I, I really wish I had more time to like spend and do go deployments like they go to, but, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, one day, especially uh, earlier today, they told me that if I want to get my hoodie, um, I have to go into a deployment. So um, I guess that's how, how I'm going to do it. Um, so with that being said, uh, Roger, uh, the floor is yours. And uh, thank you again for showing up uh, with Pacific Hackers. Um, do you have access to the uh, uh, mother, um, presenter? Uh, not yet. I just oh, gave it to him. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, it takes a few. It takes a few seconds here. But yeah, okay. while that's coming up, I'll introduce myself. Um, hey, I'm Roger Rustad. I actually work with uh, work with Marco. One of the other guys I work with might actually um, join us too. Um, let me switch over here. Tell me if you guys can see my uh, Google uh, screen. Can you see that? All right, let me hit the present button. And so you guys will, sorry, I'm horrible at go to meeting. There we go. So, let's go on to the next one. There we go. Anyway, we're a 501c3 company. Um, our our uh, focus is to really help uh, communities with technology issues after a disaster. So I don't know how much you guys know about kind of, you know, disaster and emergency management stuff. But, uh, you know, when there's a disaster, you have the, the people that come in first, you know, search and rescue, you know, police, fire, police and things like that, first responders. We typically come in a little bit later and uh, help with a lot of the long-term recovery efforts of that particular region. Um, we work a lot with uh, different, you know, with, with, with FEMA, with local local emergency management people, with VOADs, um, and we're kind of like geek squads for geek squad for those companies, for lack of a better term. Um, this is a slightly old stat. We're about 2,700 now people. So a lot of these people are IT people like yourselves, um, you know, with a lot of kind of general IT skills. We go into an area uh, and, you know, help set up networks, help set up printers, help set up all sorts of things like that so that people can kind of start rebuilding a community. Um, I mean, I'll have to tell you guys, but communications often is the biggest thing you need in order to start coordinating these sorts of things. And this gives you an idea of kind of how much we've grown in the last uh, year. Uh, we had a project, um, we had something called Project Connect, which we started uh, bringing uh, Wi-Fi uh, hotspots to kids uh, so that they could do homework and also create Wi-Fi hotspots in, um, for clinics and mobile clinics, vaccination sites. And we did over a thousand this last year with all, you know, 
hodgepodge of, of IT donations that we got from people and in, in industry. So here's kind of a high level breakdown of what we do uh, in kind of the order. Uh, we first prioritize life safety. So, you know, police, fire, EMS, emergency managers, anyone like that who needs something from us, we, we help them first in a disaster. Uh, our next priority is then mass care. So think of like the, uh, the Red Cross shelters, um, things like that, that they might stand up at a fairground, mass feeding. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of, uh, of uh, Mobile World, Kit or World Central Kitchen. Uh, we work closely with, with groups like that. Um, and then just kind of the community recovery, long-term recovery. So, you know, setting up things like, like churches and go ads and places like that that will be in an area and they're, you know, offering food and services for the people. Um, you know, they don't, they often don't have IT, IT people or they need particular equipment or, or whatever. And we'll kind of help bridge them through those times. Any questions kind of like of that or what, uh, what this means or, what IT means in these different uh, contexts or anything like that? Just kind of a, a really high level overview of kind of where we have operations. Um, as you can see, we have a lot there in Puerto Rico from Hurricane Maria, um, a lot there in the, Gulf, in the Gulf Coast there in Texas, um, a lot in New Mexico and uh, Pacific Northwest and also in Virginia, that's a lot of the COVID-19 uh, uh, sites that we've been uh, working on. Um, you know, we really depend on a lot of local people there to, to help us scale, particularly when there's something local, uh, you know, like a particular disaster that's outside of our footprint. Um, so yeah, if you guys, you guys want to get active we'll probably be have a have a really crazy fire season this next year and uh definitely be uh be busy is particularly here in northern california so here's a list of some of our capabilities um we align ourselves across the 10 regions that, that are that are in the united states that uh, fema has so our regions kind of map to theirs um, we have a lot of NIMS uh, class of vehicles and mobile command centers. Um, so I'm not, those of you that know about emergency management know that uh, you know different NIMS classes have different capabilities. Um, we also have a, a critical information systems team. So this is a group that people who've been vetted and maybe they have particular particular skills and they'll work with uh, with some of the emergency responders on more sensitive critical stuff. Here's a list of the assets that we distribute. It's completely free, no charge to the community. We, we get it free, we give it free. Uh, you can't buy our stuff or anything like that. Um, but a lot of what you see, you know, notebooks, tablets, workstations, that sort of thing. Printers are really big, obviously, in, in an area where, you know, people are printing off maps and things like that and have limited connectivity. We have uh, relationships with a lot of the big manufacturers and satellite companies. Um, and then sometimes we need, you know, radios and repeaters, depending on kind of how, how bad uh, conditions are. Um, this, is, this is one that I worked in a campfire up in uh, Chico with the Silver Dollar Fairground. Uh, we do a lot of stuff for survivors of these wildfires. Uh, anything and everything you can imagine connectivity wise. So for example, um, you know, if you're a family and you've lost everything, you've got to fill out insurance paperwork, you've got to, uh, keep your kids entertained with Netflix, you've got to, you know, you name it, Wi-Fi is kind of the, the, the thing that keeps it all together. So we help with a lot of surge, um, a lot of surge stuff in these, um, in these scenarios. So, you know, a fairground may not have enough access points to support all these people or the bandwidth that we come in and kind of create some of that stuff to help them get through the, get through the recovery period. And uh, yeah, we work closely with NGOs. Um, World Central Kitchen was kind of one of the other ones I had mentioned before. There's Team Rubicon. There's several others that I'm sure you guys uh, are familiar with, Red Cross, et cetera. Um, we're, we're often kind of the glue that uh, binds, you know, different things together where different IT talent doesn't have something or 
maybe there's a gap of what the ISP can provide or something that their IT people can provide. And uh, we just kind of figure it out as we go and help where we can. Um, yeah, some of the stuff I mentioned before, internet connectivity, network infrastructure, call centers, uh, radios, a lot of computer hardware, kind of helping people bridge the gap. Um, and then we also have some, um, some mobile command centers that we'll bring if the situation calls for it. And if there's a lot of people who, uh, a lot of different groups that will come in and we can all kind of work together on coordinating different logistics. Uh, this was one of the pictures that we took at one of our uh, training events uh, in the uh, San Francisco area at Google. Um, we have about one of these a year, but last year we, we kind of shifted and had more smaller ones virtually. Um, they just had one this last week. Um, so yeah, if you guys join and you come to one of these, there will be a lot of you know setting up gear, cable cutting, a lot of safety, big emphasis on safety in the field. Um, role playing, uh, what to do in different scenarios, uh, that sort of thing. It's a lot of fun. Um, a little bit more about our capabilities, kind of mostly what I covered. Um, this was a point to point shot that we had done in, uh, my, in uh, Michigan. Uh, you can see they're hanging something on, on this, uh, it's like a grain silo or something. Um, this is one I did here in Santa Cruz with the CZU fires. Um, this is actually a campground on the right there. That's one of uh, our volunteers climbed up on a pole and was put in a access point. Before this, they had just had a cow and a, uh, a, a, a colt. Uh, what do you guys know what cows are? They're still on wheels, but they bring them in, you know, for, for to give people uh, internet access whenever there's not a, a tower in that area. Uh, that was kind of overloaded. So we brought in our own access points and uh, worked with the local WISP to get some more bandwidth for the area and then kind of tied it all together for the for the people and um yeah when we did in washington as you can see there's there's starlink we hung our stuff behind that um a response we did for hurricane laura uh this is another one i was part of uh in the mendocino fire complex all these are firemen they had been working all day and uh came back and at least had wi-fi that they could you know text their families and um, tell their kids goodnight and stuff like that. That's often really important to these guys when they're doing this sort of thing in the field. Charging station, it's a huge deal. Um, and uh, yeah, satellites. We'll often get these satellites, aggregate them together, use some sort of SD WAN or traffic aggregation tool to 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 do this so that you know one satellite can go down and another one will uh, will pick it up. And uh, yeah, typical charging station. And we're also starting to do drone um, drone uh, uh, mapping. And we work with different uh, law enforcement to kind of map out an area, send the results to uh, uh, them. You know, this is kind of important too for survivors to be able to start the insurance paperwork. They have to show that they're that they're uh, that they that they lost their property. You can't. Do start that paperwork until you can prove it that uh, you know what the damage was. So one of the guys who's on our team is uh, an ex Googler, and uh, he donates his time to, um, to 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 basically getting all this stuff, all this footage, and then we import it into to to it to Esri, and then uh, let the the different emergency managers start picking through it and assessing the damage. The point to point we did up in the Washington. And this is uh, our COVID response uh, numbers. Actually, they look a little bit better than this, but you can see kind of the three main areas that we had were rural areas of Washington, New Mexico, and Pennsylvania. A lot of libraries, uh, schools, uh, housing projects, you know, that sort of thing. And that's basically it, guys. I don't want to, I don't want to take too much time of the other presenter and leave it open for, also leave it open for questions in case you guys have some. Well. Wow. That's really important work, Roger. Thanks for sharing all those pictures. I do have a question. Who pays for you guys when you have to travel to different locations? So yeah, when we when we go, uh, the, the volunteers don't pay anything. We'll go raise funds for the for the volunteers to to do that. So the answer is never the volunteer. That's the answer. 
Okay, awesome. Yeah, this oh. particular picture is of uh, uh, the campfire. Uh, everyone here is from, from California, right? You guys know about the campfire up in paradise. Um, all these people brought gifts and you know you think gifts are an awesome thing gifts are actually a huge pain in the butt to to manage and to process and everything like that so you know we'll often work with these places in kind of documenting what all the things are creating some sort of a database there's a lot of ad hoc tools that we'll figure out for them um you know you'd be surprised inventory is just a huge part of this um and then all the it stuff that goes along with, with that is another oh yeah these are the scanners that we use to uh start tagging the different boxes we got a whole bunch of them and started putting them in a spreadsheet oh, it looks like google yeah google's even open there and then just kind of offloaded that from some of the, the police and fire and yeah there's some of the survivor sites that they that they stayed at while there um this is the red cross there in silver dollar uh, this is kind of a network map we had made and this was Kind of a long-term project. There were several different groups up there that came up to to help for the next year or two, and we just offered a bunch of IT stuff that they needed. Um, anyway, quick summary of kind of the different things and assets we have. And uh, if you guys want to know more, go to itdrc.org. And if you have questions, you can just email info at itdrc.org. And um, yeah, happy to tell you guys more. May I ask a quick question? Yeah, you just did. Do you want to ask another one? Oh, yes. May I ask two quick questions? Yes. Um, uh, how closely do you work with um, the workforce development boards? And I ask that because locally in Santa Cruz, they were very active with a lot of cleanup and the rescue efforts, but I don't know how they connected with you guys. And then um, they offer, you know, supplemental um uh, payments, uh, the students and various people can sign up to, you know, earn to help out with uh, the recovery effort, but yeah. was it necessarily connected with you guys? And, you know, that's something that we would like to get our students connected with, but yeah, anyways. Well, uh, we don't, I mean, we don't take any payment. You can't really buy our services. You can't buy our stuff or anything. So, I mean, if people are wanting to get paid, this is probably not the best way to, to do it. No, the, the workforce. Uh, but it's a good way. It's a good, it's, yeah, it's a good way to get skills and a good way to, you know, flex and show how awesome you are to the community, which you can maybe translate to a job. A lot of people okay. use it for jobs. I think it's more in partnership. Like so I mean, then they would just go ahead. You directly as an individual workforce development board. Perhaps this is an email I should send you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know much about the workforce development stuff, and I, I haven't really seen too many of them in. in in uh, these yeah. things, we typically work maybe with more volunteer us, groups. Maybe you okay. can tell us about what they are, Denise, just just to create an awareness. Um, the workforce development boards are essentially your one-stop centers in the the counties. They uh, uh, they handle all of the uh, the federal money coming down. Workforce Investment Act, WIOA. I think that's what it was called, Opportunity Act. Anyways, it's federal assistance that comes to the local counties for adults who are needing retraining or employment uh, for youth. Um, you know, fairly fairly large programs, and um, that all the higher ed and K-12s were all supposed to be connected and working together. And this is an area where it looks like the, we could be um, working a little bit closer, at least locally. And since there are fires going on right now in our area, um, you know, that's something I think we'll be mm -hmm. jumping into again in the future. Awesome, yeah, a lot awesome. of what we do is we help the places that don't have this sort of thing. I mean, I think it's awesome if you do have a place with money being dumped in, I think for every, you know, thing that's declared a federal disaster, it's, you know, I see, I've seen stats that only like 1% of things are declared a federal disaster. So a lot of our efforts go into these other communities, smaller communities that don't have this sort of thing. And that seems to be sometimes where our time and money is, as well is better spent. Okay, and I'd love to connect with you, Denise, um, just the Pacific Hackers Organization is doing some great things um, for the community as well. And um, I'd love to connect with you on the side just to tell you a little bit more about that and how we're evolving. Thank you. Okay, Marco, next on the list, who's speaking? Okay, um, I think Marco had to do something. 
um, I will uh, continue. Uh, and um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, this has been a, a very uh, important and uh, informational for us. And hopefully some of you guys will, will get to join and experience uh, participating in a organization like this. Uh, and now I'm going to pass it up to uh, our very own Irvin, uh, who's going to talk about uh, Bay Cyber and uh, their initiatives and uh, what they do and um, all that good jazz. So take it away, man. Thank you, Rod. Um... So hi, my name's Irvin. Um, I run the cyber competitions program for the Bay Area. Uh, with me are the students that I hired to be part of the admin team. It's these students who create contests, who execute them, who do the research, who get that hands-on industry level experience that has proven to help them get ready for the real world. What this program does is it it shows middle school, high school, and community college students the world of cybersecurity in a way that's accessible to them. So we create training materials for them. We provide uh, resources. So if a, a school uh, wants to join us and they have nothing but Chromebooks, we provide everything that they need to participate. We provide mentorship to those students. Uh, we help them get started in the field. Uh, one of the big things one of the big visions behind it is at the very least, we make students safer than when they started with us. And at the very best, they start their career in cybersecurity. We have been around since 2016. And it started as just a summer camp following a very specific curriculum. And uh, as, uh, the, as it grew, I was given more, more leniency and what, what we can do with it. And I, once I had enough leniency, I turned it around and exploded the, the program. Uh, I had I needed help in that explosion, and that's where Denise Moss came in. She has been my right hand since, helping me with all the administrative and operations side, uh, working with the colleges because I'm I'm a technical person. You know, I I am I understand the technical side in and out, and I have the vision and creativity for that. But when it comes to uh, when it comes to the organization side with the Bay Area colleges and all that, that's where Denise comes in and really helps me uh, make sure everything everything's still going well uh, on that on that end. Uh, and then with that, I brought in students to help design and build and run uh, all the various contests in the Bay Area. So I'm going to introduce them, and they can they'll talk a bit about themselves, and and we have some questions uh for them so the first person that i'm going to introduce is brandon he joined us as a high schooler in 2018 17 i believe 17. uh hi yeah um like he said i have been with the team for about three years i i ended this january to pursue bigger and better things but uh working with them during the summer was my first introduction to cybersecurity. Uh, which eventually led into an apprenticeship with a, a forensic expert that was local to Santa Cruz. And um, from there, I built up my knowledge, built up my experience, and eventually landed a full-time job as of yesterday, actually. So uh, a lot of really good things to say about this team, and, and we'll get into that, but that's me. And the next person I want to introduce is Jeremy. Hi, yeah, I had a bit of a weird story. Um, I grew up in Singapore. During my time there, I became a paramilitary firefighter for about two years um, before I moved on back over midway through 2017, uh, which is when I joined in. By the way, um, yeah, uh, Roger, I saw some of the stuff earlier that was super cool. I liked the, the tent setup you had there. I do have memories of sleeping in a cement uh, stairwell from an apartment because uh, that was across from where a fire was to take a quick breather. <laughs> Nice. Um, yeah, we we uh, we were told to give everyone everyone internet except the prisoners. They didn't need Wi-Fi. <laughs> Whatever we did. Um, but yeah, after that, I I joined in at Cabrillo to to start my education, and uh, I think within my first semester at Cabrillo, I was working for Irvin. 
Um, I was really interested in the topic. You know, I'd already pursued cybersecurity, uh, th like theory and, and education on my own time. Um, but, you know, I was, I was starting that path at Cabrillo and being able to work in it uh, really helps me branch out with that. Um, granted, I am also ending my stint with Irvin uh, after this, this year's summer camp um, because I am transferring over to SFSU uh, to hopefully get a four-year degree. Uh, and I think that's about all I will say for now. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, next to introduce is Ryan. Hello, uh, I'm Eric Garcia. Um, I used to um, study astrophysics, um, uh, mostly astronomy, but I really started getting into math of it. And I was pursuing that for uh, about four years. And I, uh, I was told I have to take a class in programming. And I realized that I like computers a lot more than I like math. Um, and so I came back to Korea. Um, uh, when I, I moved home uh, after a bit uh, high school, um, and uh, basically got engrossed in cybersecurity, um, my first class at uh, Rio in cybersecurity, I was just like, this is what I want to do. Um, and you know, everybody picked me up, uh, getting honest, he showed me that this is way better than uh, whatever I wanted to do before. Um, so I, I'm still a little new. Um, a little. I've only been in here for uh, about two years, maybe three. I've been on the scene for about a year and a half, and it's uh, really shown me a lot of stuff. Um, and I plan to pursue it um, forever, really. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, next is Juan. Hello, everybody. Um. So about me, I was actually, uh, um, well, let me go a little bit further back. I, I've been doing, I used to do a lot of like military related programs as a kid. Uh, I started at eight years old in this program called Young Marines. Um, I did that for a few years up until high school. And then in high school, I joined uh, Junior ROTC. So I was really like focused on this and I like really wanted to go that route. So I, I kept going and I ended up getting into the uh, United States Air Force Academy back in 2018. And uh, going in there, you know, after like half of the first semester, I decided that if I keep pursuing this, I was going to just, I mean, I, I was only going to know military and the military lifestyle. And to me at that point, I was like, okay, I need a change in pace. Um, ended up leaving, actually ended up going to Santa Cruz after that, and then joined Cabrillo. I was at Cabrillo, like the first semester at Cabrillo, I was like, all right, well, I don't have a job. So I was like working as a, as a, as a market, uh, what do you call that? A farmer's market seller. I was selling French like bread and I was just like, okay, you know, maybe this is not what I want to do the rest of my life. Like that Cabrillo's job site, saw some like IT like internships down the street. Um, got into Looker as a, a IT intern. I was like, this is cool. Like I want to pursue this. So I actually ended up changing my major from computer engineering to cybersecurity. And then I met up with Irvin. He was telling me he's like, yeah, man, this is the route to go. And I was like, here I am. Um, and that's mainly it. I I was unfortunately, I unfortunately had to leave Urban Side because I was offered an opportunity as a software engineering intern at Balbix, which is a company in San Jose. Um, but if not, like if I could like pursue this and just stay here, I would. He says, unfortunately, taking the next step in his career. <laughs> I mean, but honestly, like I had, I've, I feel like the project-based learning with you was like, major in anything better than anything i can do yeah i want to butt in just to a second that one um i think everyone working under Irvin has that same mentality I, I personally got a job offer like halfway through my time here that you know ten dollars an hour more but i would be at some it company turning things off and on again um which was nightmarish to think about all things considered because i'm sitting here learning stuff and having fun the whole way along you know 
And, oh, uh, last but not least, the guy who's been with me for way longer than we want to admit, Vinay. So I was in high school in SoCal, kind of met up with Irvin and um, was part of his program in, his, in the infancy. And then eventually came to UC Santa Cruz for computer science, but decided that programming wasn't quite what I wanted to pursue. So I joined Cabrillo and the team to do more cybersecurity stuff last fall. And I've been working with the team doing what everyone else has already mentioned. And uh, I actually have an offer with CrowdStrike as an application security engineer that I'll be pursuing in the future. So this is about my last time with the team as well. Uh, so we have grown from just a simple uh, summer camp to a academic year-long program to uh, becoming national. Uh, this same group creates the cybersecurity contest for all of California and Florida through Skills USA, along with making contests for the, the San Francisco Bay Area and everything else that we do along the way. Uh, this is a very busy group. They they have they do a whole lot of projects, uh, and as you've seen, they they definitely get put through the ringer and come out quite victorious. So I have a few questions to get the ball started, and um, we'll let let them answer. If you have any questions, put them in the chat, and, and let's let's see. Uh, my first question for the group uh, is: What has been the most fun or the best experience you've had? Uh, can we start with the um, the bug bounty story? Yeah, go ahead. Oh. I feel like that was definitely the most fun that I had with this team. Do we need to screen share the Instagram post? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so I'll I'll uh, give you a brief. Uh, we administered plenty of in-person competitions before the lockdown times, um, and one of them was called the bug bounty. We crafted fake bank servers on I believe they were Raspberry Pis, small computers. Uh, with various ATM hardware components. So the students were tasked to seek out the bugs that we had planted. Um, but it was very chaotic because we uh, we were scrambling with the IT department to try and figure out how the internet was gonna get hooked up in our, our testing area, which was the cafeteria. And then I don't, no, not pointing fingers here, but someone left on <laughs> the infrastructure overnight and we actually got breached by someone looking to find a, uh, a real life bank server. <laughs> Um, but, you know, by the time that we were ready to deploy, we got everything pulled together uh, and it, it was great. We had a lot of fun with the students on that one. We had a, a live panel of judges that were there to uh, critique the students and give them feedback. But it was a lot of context as to um, what happened that day. Yeah, <laughs> walk, walking in on the morning of the competition, because our, our, those days are always flooded. You're just always on. Someone's going to need help. Something isn't working. We need all of our TAs on deck at all time. So having that had happened uh, to start off the morning was uh, quite the adventure. Uh, not only did the, the competitors have to find bugs, our own team had to find their own bugs and, and patch them so that the competitors would have a, a fair playing game. That was that was quite the morning. But uh, credit where it's due, Vinay found and fixed the bug that day. Yeah, and we're up and rolling again yeah, in no time. Speaking yeah. of like the most fun experiences uh, in that competition, we also spoofed credit, which I thought was pretty cool. I was, ah, uh, yes. Um, uh, a lot of hardware um, stuff, and it was uh, a lot of learning, and we we got to show um, some of the students how how easy and how scary some of these old credit cards are, and uh, it was that was probably one of the funnest experiences I had. I, it was great. I got to learn how to solder. Rushing to solder together like two or three more because they had uh, they'd broken down throughout the day. Uh, but yeah, and I was that was one heck of an adventure. Um, mm -hmm. We seem to always have them like that, though, you know. Well, we can't anticipate everything that'll happen, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's. I'm I'm sure as everyone here knows, there's there's at least that one thing that has to go wrong, and being good at your job is being able to adapt to it more so than uh, preventing bad things from happening or things from going wrong on occasion. Well, and it's also about maintaining like that growth mindset because I believe that one of the reasons that they got hacked were uh, like 
poor password management, uh, which was a intentional. We wanted the students to find that, but then that bit us in the butt because, you know, it was it was obviously very easy to exploit. So it showed us like, oh, we can't we can't just you know play this dumb. We have to think very carefully about what we're giving the students and how we're executing it. So that was what definitely else? my favorite day. Yeah. Uh, what else? What other fun best experiences you've had? Oh, I can I can ramble about scoring engine for a bit. That'll be fun. So um, when I started out, we were only doing Cyber Patriot, um, and I don't want to get too opinionated here, but uh, I, I'm I'm big about gamification, about making this fun. I've always enjoyed this field. It, it's always been something where like I'll spend my my first experience was Metasploitable was on my own time. And that was a fun, relaxing Friday night for me, um, kind of thing. And um, so, scoring engine was not, or sorry, not scoring engine. Uh, Cyber Patriot was not that, at least at the level we were uh, working in. Um, but we did hear a bit about higher up, and they had a cool scoring system that gave uh, people points based off of what systems they had up. A lot of my time working with Irvin was spent on making our own version of that. Um, to con not necessarily to compete with Cyber Patriot, but yeah, to compete with Cyber Patriot. Um, and this started from me because I'm I'm uh, earlier on I was definitely a junior programmer. Um, I was still used to not using external libraries. Um, so version one of Scoring Engine was uh, outputting text to a to a uh, Apache server, so just updating the the web page on the fly instead of having any CGI or background scripts running, relying on like low level socket connections for all the communications and took me a lot of time to make something with not too much to show for it. Granted, thanks to Vinay uh, for, for being the one to help me learn how to program a bit better. Um, Scoring Engine V3 uh, a while later has been quite wonderful. We have a fancy Flask based web UI um, and, and it was really evolved through all of that. but. I've had so oh. many great memories working on that project. Uh, you we, don't talk about about? we don't talk about Scoring Engine V2. <laughs> oh, hey, hey, Scoring Engine V2 wasn't bad. It was better than V1. V1 was entirely hard-coded. Scoring Engine V2 was less hard-coded. <laughs> but, but we were able to use Scoring Engine V3 for a couple of competitions this year, and it went pretty smoothly. Um, the competitions were successful after our changes and no longer using uh, connections and direct connections, CCP connections for everything. So it's a lot uh, easier for easier for us to manage as well as for there's less things that can go wrong. So it's been a smooth experience overall. Yeah. Um, in addition to some load balancing changes we had made. Um, but yeah, it was nice. Just you don't really it's hard to to push yourself to sit there and start working on databases or moving to a to a web API when you're on your own and it's something new. But having the other having Vinay in this case, who was a bit more experienced with this stuff, to jump into it forced me to jump in, and I at least hope I was a lot more helpful than I was initially expecting myself to be. Um, but uh, we did have some fun with Git blame that day or during that se those uh, sessions. Um, Oh, but yeah, it's that project. <sighs> V1 had a fun story behind it. That was a Discord message sent. Uh, oh, no, it was a two-parter. There was the 8 a.m. I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this in time by by the competition. Here's my plan to fix it. Um, followed by another message at 4 a.m. the morning before a competition of I got it working. I'm going to bed now. <laughs> um so yeah, that's been its, its wild adventure. But I've also, you know, I, I think something that was fun about this job is although I had my big magnum opus of programming and designing the system, I was also working on a lot more of my soft skills. Um, you know, I think Irvin's going to end up describing this better than I did because I was just, I, I was so in the zone. I don't remember too much was hap that uh, what was going on. But one of our competitions, um, I had to make sure everyone was in the right room at the right time or certain groups of people were in the right room at the right time, which led to me sprinting around a San Jose campus uh, on a Saturday morning for quite a while uh, in, in a full suit. Um, but, you know, for me, I actually have issues with social anxiety. Um, uh, you may not be able to see it, but my leg is shaking like wild right now because I have to talk to like a whole 12 people. Um, but it, it's really been a chance to work on that and just get used to it in a professional sense because it's a skill you need, you know. 
um, nothing wrong with being nervous about talking to people, but you have to be able to overcome your nervousness. And I, given my own choices, I would have been at home clicking away on my computer alone the past three years instead of actually going out and doing stuff like this. Um, if I can expand on that a little bit, uh, just with the social aspect, the team has been a very good opportunity for me to uh, meet people of a like mind because there are so many of us out there who are very interested in cybersecurity, but actually making those connections is a different story. Um, and I still have people on my reference list on my on my uh, my CV that were on this team two years ago, you know, um, and we keep up contacts. I like to see how they're doing. Uh, and it's it's been such a, a growth opportunity in, in that sense for me and I, I think a few other people as well. And it was it was funny. You uh, I, you'd been gone for six months, I think, by about now. Yeah. I quit like six months ago and I'm, I'm still here. <laughs> you, you rejoined the, the, the voice call. And I'm like, oh yeah, Brandon's here, right, right on time. <laughs> didn't even didn't even notice you were gone, honestly. Um, well, thanks. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> uh, it's all oh, fair, yeah, no, it's it, in a good way. You're, you're always part of the team. Um, yeah. it, it just, it feels more comfortable having you here in the group call. <laughs> um, and it's, it's always been like that. Like we now, even now we still have people from, uh, uh, like way before here who weren't working here as much, who were talking in chat regularly, who we stay communicated with. Um, yeah, this team really was, is something special. Um, there's a reason why I think many of us have had the experience of getting a job offer that is air quotes better that we turned down because we wouldn't be growing as people as much and we wouldn't have this wonderful work environment. Gosh, Jeremy, thank you so much for saying that. You are such a breath of fresh air. Inspirational, truly, thank you. So I, I got a question. How helpful is this to getting a job? Because uh, you know, most of the companies that I talk to, and even whenever I'm looking for candidates, uh, typically look for someone with projects and demonstrable, you know, demonstrable skills like this. Um, and it's kind of more important than your pedigree or your degrees or anything like that, but it's like something concrete you've done and, and have accomplished and can then articulate. Uh, I can answer this. Um, there have been so many projects that we've worked on uh, as a team. Uh, we've worked on everything from programming to running competitions, teaching and tutoring students. Uh, someone would have found something that they liked and have definitely worked on their skills. Like for Jeremy and myself, we've worked on a lot of the infrastructure and programming in the last few months, but also related to cybersecurity, which is not a combination that a lot of people are able to get through education. So it's been able to help focus our skills in a direction that is highly in demand, but very little supply. So it's been, it's helped me get a job. And I'm sure that can be, the same can be said for the other people on the team, like Brandon and Juan that have recently gotten offers. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, even then, just kind of being able to have what we have to show from our work has been wonderful. Um, you know, for, for me and Vinay working on Scoring Engine V3, that was my first time working on a large project um, as a group. And it, it was just nice. It's, it's you have the people where you can really mesh with well and um, being able to work up that group ethic for like large, meaningful projects, not just uh, doing a science report that's a week long of talking to three other people. Um, really is one of those skills that you're not going to be, be able to learn at college um, at the level it's needed or used in the professional realm, um, where you might be working with the same group of people on something for four or five years. Um, and that can be really important to actually making it beneficial, because uh, I'm sure many of you have heard that what one progr programmer can do in a week, uh, 20 programmers can do in a month and a half. Um, it's a lot of that just comes from you start adding on more stuff, things spread out too much, a lot of work gets done that might not be as viable because everyone has a different idea in their mind of what the project is and what it should be. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of very dynamic things that we did on the team. Um, ne never did we do the same thing twice, which meant that we had a lot of learning to do, especially considering that we have to then teach that to a group of students. So, you know, from everything, everything between open source software and, you know, proprietary cloud services, um, you know, we had to really know the ins and outs of that. So I, I can speak 
to, I don't actually know how much I can disclose, but uh, of the interview I had with this job I just got, uh, they were looking over my CV and they're like, oh, you can really do this? Like, you know how to ad administer like a Microsoft Active Directory? And I'm like, I mean, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I can show you, you know, um, it, it's great not only to feel like you're part of something bigger, of course, but also to have that expansive opportunity and that it, it just kept growing and kept changing. Yeah, it's it's actually, it's funny going forward. I feel like during my job interview, I'm going to be a little bit snarky because I'm like, are you really going to offer me this good of a work environment? I got high standards here. I need to make sure, I, I need to make sure I get along perfectly with everyone. We're all, you know, gung-ho about getting stuff done. I need to be able to put my legs up and play some music on the job if I need to cool off for a second and have everyone know that's all in uh, helping the work ethic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've, I've worked a, a, you know, what is a intended or ultimately a TA job at a college, but it's given me all this. It, it's almost surreal how different the life that this team is living compared to the other TAs and some of the other departments at Cabrillo, um, in terms of what we're creating and, you know, it's how much work we have to put in ultimately. <sighs> so I would encourage you guys definitely to leverage that. I mean, whatever I got my degree. I was, it was 94 to 98 and I worked in campus IT, you know, networking system stuff. Those four years of getting paid $6 an hour instantly gave me a leg up in the workplace. And, you know, all my friends had cool stuff to do in the summer. I didn't, but uh, I never felt like I had to look for a job after that, after getting that solid footing of experience. So yeah, that's awesome. You guys are doing this. I think uh, you guys are smart for looking looking now and taking you know taking something that seems to pay less but much more much more in the long run not everyone has that uh that vision and don't chase the dollar chase the skill and the dollars will come man i wanted to add on a little bit to that um even just like even working here i feel like we were all of us got a lot of good direction on like career like we're always pointed in the right direction. Somebody would know a little bit about a certification that we would need to get, or um, Urban would know about the next thing you should go after. He would have like maybe beta, beta testings uh, for certs that maybe we need to go do, and he would like recommend for us to go get. Um, uh, a few of us have just recently done uh, a few certs. I know through, I, I had no idea what Security Plus CompTIA was, so. I got that and I also was able to get pen test plus. So those are really cool. And it's a, something that you can't get. You most likely wouldn't get just by going to school. Oh yeah. And there's also, you know, um, although yeah, we have the, the heavy guidance if needed, um, scoring engine was more or less me wanting to go and make a thing. Um, Guacbot as well was, uh, I, I definitely don't want to say that was me, but, uh, I was the one who got fed up the quickest, having had to work with Guacamole one one night and immediately started coding a bot to do it for us, even if it was the simple requests. And uh, Vinay and Ryan were the ones that really took that forward. I think it was surprising, too, because that's full on. That's a, a system we had made uh, Wait, casually on the side. I didn't think we had a oh. contest, some, right. some context into what that was, what that is. Yeah, fair. That, all right, I'm going to leave that to Vinay and Ryan then because I only coded one part of it uh, one evening like a year ago. <laughs> okay. Um, I can start. Uh, sorry if my if my audio is out. My internet's a little iffy right now. Um, about about eight months ago, uh, we, we were fed up working with uh, guacamole and doing stuff by hand. So we created a bot um, on Discord, um, which is very much uh, um, very very similar to Slack if you've never used it. Um, and you request uh, and it uh, also utilizes uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, just to create uh, instances for um, someone. They're timed. Whoever uh, whoever wants one can have one for about an hour. Uh, really, the thought was to um, kind of do something similar to what a lot of these um, 
Uh, states are doing like try hack me the box. A lot of these sort of have ways to borrow a computer, and we set up to do that, and uh, it, it worked out really well. We're actually using it for our summer camp right now, and things are are looking pretty good on it. Um, it's just an automated way to play a virtual machine, and uh, a lot. Jeremy a lot did of help me. He, uh, a Chrome lot of the students that we have uh, have Chromebooks. That that's what the school issues them. And if you've ever messed with a Chromebook, you know they're pretty locked down. You can't run virtual machines. You can't really do much. But we found, um, I, I'm pretty sure it was Jeremy who first found Apache Guacamole as an HTML5 way of getting uh, you know, to the desktop. So we said, that okay, was we Ryan. can use it. Just interject. I was we, the one who got bored or who got upset about it the first. Ryan yeah. was the one who found it. <laughs> yeah, we, we found it. We said, OK, we could use this. And then, yeah, we, we started providing students access to it. And then, yeah, Jeremy said, you know what, this, this is horrible to manually issue out credentials and manage it. And yeah, just go, uh, spend, I think I was spending a, a Saturday night making 30 or 40 different uh, student accounts in Guacamole, which was, you know, poor, poor Ryan, I, I believe he was the one carrying all the weight for that before had just gotten used to making like, yeah, no, I got to make 120 accounts now. That That's my evening. Yeah, we, um, we serve about 700 or so students. So, you know, making accounts by hand sucks. And then they came up with the idea of using a bot to do it. And now a student in our program just requests uh, by by a bot command and they'll get a, a machine that they need. And now they can do the work from any machine that they're on. So that that's that's part of us providing those resources to students so that that is not a barrier for them to get into cybersecurity. I like to mention that uh, this is by far my, my favorite part of the job. Um, and, and maybe the most interesting too is to uh, create a project and to see it to the end. Um, you know, you go through uh, all the beginnings, all the middle, you got a lot of testing, a lot of testing, and um, it was just a lot, a lot to do. And there's a lot of, uh, we do a lot with our, uh, our competitions and stuff. We, we create a lot of stuff just from really thin air at times, a lot of ideas. So it, it gets very creative and uh, yeah. definitely my favorite aspect. Um, that actually gives me something I wouldn't mind going on about for, for a short while. Sadly, they're not all successes, um, but it, that's that's life. Not not every idea you have is going to be perfect. Um, some, something's going to go wrong somewhere. But uh, or something a bit more out there, I remember last summer camp, I, I had a Minecraft server going as part of the thing. And it wasn't like just kid playing, kids playing Minecraft. It was, it was the computer mods. I was having a lot of fun. Um, I grew up really liking these mods because you're sitting there coding Lua for a uh, a block in Minecraft to go around and mine other blocks for you. Um, but th there was some crazy stuff with that. And although um, during the time I wasn't able to give that project itself the commitment that I think it needed to really be sex successful, um, it was it was so much fun to be able to try stuff like that. And we do have projects like this fairly often. Um, and they're honestly more successful than not, which is. Uh, which is a fun part about the job is sitting there and actually yeah, being able to see the project go off and have something happen. Um, but but being able to do stuff like that uh, was incredible because like I had fun, you know. It, it did kind of suck that I couldn't really uh, see see that product to its fullest potential. But at the same time, like just being able to try it, being able to go to my boss and be like, hey, you know what the summer camp needs? Minecraft would have would have been wonderful, um, or it is wonderful, you know. Uh, it's it's really a great part about the job is being able to try stuff like that that's a little bit out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, if I may add some context to that. Um, the, the reason that we wanted to put up the Minecraft server was because it was our first summer camp that was all remote due to COVID. And um, we were trying to find an answer to the hardware component of the summer camp where students understood the components of a computer and how to put them together and, and what that means. So it, it didn't turn out to be the best solution, but like Jeremy said, it was it was a great idea. And like Ryan said, you have to deliver at the end of the day. So yeah. he Jeremy really put his heart and soul into making that happen and having it spread for the students. But 
you know, we, I think we were all very booked that summer trying to make We were all very work. booked. And also it wasn't, it was the kind of thing where you'd need students to sign up for separately because they already have to invest the 15 or $25 to buy this physical game to play, play, uh, play with us. But it was a fun little experiment and some of the kids did like it. It just wasn't enough to build a proper community and move forward. Um, but yeah. And also thank you, Brandon. You remember more about my own project than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was supposed to be our project and then I got completely sidetracked making content. So yeah. Yeah. We both got it. <laughs> oh yes. Uh. <laughs> Let's see. I have the the reverse question for you guys. The most challenging part of the of being on this team. Oh, I can. I'll, I'll get mine uh, out of the way really quickly here. Uh, remember that four a.m. message I sent? I would say about the eight hours leading up to then. <laughs> um. I have a question. Did you guys find it easy uh, to pass the CompTIA Security Plus exam? Ooh, yes. <laughs> um, the Not structure. Having experience. Oh, yeah. yeah. And did you have exposure prior to as well too, or you just kind of went from being a student and then going right into it and just taking it? I'd love to hear how you transitioned into it, how long it took you, the difficulty level you thought it was and uh, anything that you can share that helps the next person. Thank you. Definitely. Um, I, I'd love to speak to this because without Urban's guidance, I probably wouldn't have taken any of the certifications that I had, or at least in the time that I did. Uh, I got hooked on this whole cybersecurity thing with, uh, with the ACCC through their summer camps, and that led me to concurrently enroll when I was in high school uh, in the cybersecurity classes that were provided at Cabrillo. And the whole point of the classes was to gear you up and make sure you understand everything you need to pass those exams. Um, so I took the ethical hacking class that Urban hosted um, my junior year of high school. And from that class, I learned everything I needed to gear up and get ready for the security plus that along with the prerequisite class. Um, and you know, all I had to study was my notes. I had to ask a couple questions and I, I did pretty okay on it. Um, and the opportunity arose because I think Urban either had a comp or a heavy discount for the exam. Through I, the, I, yeah. Yeah, and that was like such a, a breath of fresh air because, you know, that's that's an industry level certification that we were able to get myself at a very young age and um, it, it very easily facilitated through the college. Yeah, and it's, it's one of those things to uh, part of why we use Discord and some of the nice things about that is these group notifications. Um, I recently, like two weeks ago, uh, took my pen test plus, And although I'm not too, uh, it was the beta, so I wasn't too confident or I don't really know how well I did, um, especially because the COVID-19 vaccine was, uh, I'd just gotten dose two the day before. Um, and it was also an exam that was at midnight because I don't know how to tell time. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the reactions, Denise. They're wonderful. <laughs> um, but yeah, like even then, I was in this horrible state. You know, had, on question fifty out of a hundred out of ten, I realized I really needed to go to the bathroom, so I was rushing too. But it went really well. I did not feel unprepared. You know, I'm not confident that entirely that I passed it because of aforementioned reasons. But it was not lack of preparation. Um, and that was my first CompTIA test ever uh, that I'd ever actually taken. And just, I also only found out about it because Irvin had posted in our Discord channel, hey, beta's on sale right now, $50 only. Um, just happy to jump at that chance. Oh, oh. Go ahead. Thank oh, you. I have a question. Um, so I have a WeSuits chapter, a Women in Cybersecurity chapter down here in South Florida. A student chapter. So I'm very interested in hearing how uh, women or young women are engaged or engaging in your program. We have we have a legendary middle school all girls team. They came out of nowhere in 2018 and took second place in a contest that was predominantly college and high school. Uh, they, I think if you had asked around the room 
and the judges, they would have never guessed that they would have done so well in both their technical knowledge and their soft skills. They have been with us ever since and have been our leading examples. From them, we have had a number of high schools bring up all girls teams and participate and win in our various contests. So things like the bug bounty that we did, the uh, small business consultation, that's the first time we all met them. Uh, we did our Cyber Olympics this past winter. Uh, they, we have seen a growth of girls and those, those middle school girls have always been my favorite because they, they were the unexpected. Yeah, I, I, that day too, just cause it was also, it was an all middle school team, you know, no one except ex expects to see the all middle school team up on, on the front stage. Uh, they're up on, on the stage getting first place. Um, so we were all really excited to hear that from them. And they also, they won by like a landslide. We're talking like they got 700 points and and second place got 500. I I that was that was a fun day. That was one of our more interesting com uh, competitions as well. And I think uh, uh, we we do try to be uh, experimental also in our competition designs that enable stuff like that. Um, for example, that one I know a strong part of it was it mattered more your presentation um, to the judges. You know, being able to sit there and have those soft skills because when it comes down to it. You can have all the technical knowledge in the world, but if you're if you're unsociable, not really good at handling those soft skills and interacting with people, that doesn't mean a thing. And they came in and applied advanced soft skills, and it really worked. On top of having their technical down to a T. Um, but yeah, that was that was a really cool, really cool Saturday. Um, yes, we have we have a girl presence, and they are rock stars. Um, I also think the summer camp's been doing something with that as well, although. Um, I think for those, if my understanding is correct, for those programs, we like to have um, uh, uh, all-girl teachers as well, um, just to make it more comforting. So I personally wouldn't know too much uh, yeah, we in terms of introductory cyber camp that, that wrapped up this last week. But then, um, honestly, with everything, uh, all of our marketing, Amy, we could always do, always do better, you know, with with making sure the message is, is getting out there and always have more girls in the program, ladies, females, women. Yeah, I was just going to ask, like, what do you think, if there's anything that you do differently um, to appeal to women in your programs? Or if you can think of anything that's kind of like a great tip. That's part of what we're, why we're gathered as a group. Erwin is a board member with Pacific Hackers as well, too. And we're trying to um, do just that, bring um, women up into the fold to um, work alongside men as well and um, bring up students, vets, et cetera, and um, really just share in the knowledge of, um, you know, the skill sets and the tools that they need to be working with um, so that we can um, really grow the cybersecurity community and put you all to work. So um, that's the notion. And so Amy, I know you're working with us as well, um, but, you know, Denise will work with you as well. And, and for the person who, I talked about um, working with what WESIS. Um, I'm part of that group as well, so I will be working with them as well to bring them into the fold. And hopefully, we just have really some unity in the community about um, how we can, um, you know, all work together. So thank you. Uh, I can't speak too much to the process because I was never a part of the recruitment of who we get for our. Uh, camps and our competitions, but um, I very much noticed in the last summer camp that I, I was helping create the content for, um, because we were remote, or perhaps because it was great on uh, one of our team members, Brienne, uh, we had outreach between Santa Cruz and San Francisco, which is, you know, a huge like 100 mile range uh, between us and Contra Costa, and there was a very large, diverse group of people, uh, of students who were attending those programs. Um, so if there's one thing I think we do really well, it's outreach. And it's the outreach uh, that I think makes the difference. And, you know, letting people know that cybersecurity is accessible to everybody and that we want to elevate anyone if they have the interest uh, to, to join us. Now that actually brings up a fun tangent. Uh, we haven't talked about our presence at the local county fair yet. I mean, oh, I guess yeah. that's a bit old news nowadays, but that was always a fun yearly uh, event we would have. Um, we'd be at the the uh, Santa Cruz County Fair, 
and just have our own little booth as part of the Cabrillo, Cabrillo section. But we'd be showing off a lot of fun stuff, playing with our toys. Um, and honestly, that was that was one of the more fun and almost fulfilling parts of this job, too. As is, is cool as a great project is, I remember there, there was this one kid where I was showing him just like a, the uh, arrow dump scan on full screen on a projector. And I could just see it in his eyes. The stuff had just grabbed his mind. He's like... It, it was beautiful. It was, it was that first time you, you get Hello World printed out on the screen because your your code compiled, um, and you know that that happened. Oh, that was two years ago almost, and like I still remember that deep in my soul because of how great of a moment it was, and uh, stuff like that was is pretty common. I think the county fair is our, our main moment for it, but um, it did have a lot of moments like that. Like it was. It'd be occasionally annoying. You have some of the punk kids, you know, wanting to learn how to steal their friend's Instagram account. Then you have the kids who aren't super familiar with it and, like, are, are kind of... We, we try to focus on a, yes, you can do this. Um, you know, like, at, at the county fair, I was showing people, like, yeah, no, it's just one simple command. And look, you're looking at everything in the nearby area. Not even trying to take anything, just looking around in a nice, organized way. Um, so, yeah, getting stuff like that was, was really nice. Um, and it's always fun to see. I have a question. Um, how I, I heard the word cyber patriot, right? Um, have you guys? What would you say has been the influence of a cyber in you guys performing in other competitions? Is, are there specific competitions that you would say because we did this, we did better? Uh oh. Can can I can I be opinionated here, Irvin? Can I get a nod on that? All right, cool. I got a nod on that. Um. So from my experiences, and granted, I think I was a year, year and a half behind things really getting started when I joined in. Um, that was the point in which we were kind of spiteful towards Cyber Patriot. Not, not that we like dislike it or anything, but it just, it could have been better. And you have to sit there with that feeling of we're sitting here and like presenting this challenge that can be completed by a script. And that's not fun. That's not how you, how you make things um, interesting to students. And uh, I know at least for my own, uh, standpoint of working with some of the stuff, and I think this was before the, um, I don't remember which competition this was, but one of them, I'm sitting up there, I'm like, all right, let's let's do Legend of Zelda here. We have items, we have exploration, we have this. How do we translate in, this into a computer network that the students have to explore for a competition? Um, and that's why I had mentioned gamification earlier, is, is stuff like that, like, there's a lot of ways you can make this stuff really cool and really fun. Um, but you just got to take take the extra month to really leverage it, I think. Um, you know, there's some there's some middle ground between the, the Hackers movie uh, and, and real life that you can kind of balance it out, and that really can get the students' attentions quite, uh, attention quite well. So I used to be a competitor at Cyber Patriot for three years before moving on here. So I can answer it from both sides. Um, what Jeremy said about how a script can solve it was by far the worst part about Cyber Patriot, just because uh, there's very little growth that you can do. You learn how to script something, you do it, and then you kind of just sitting there looking at each other's faces for the remainder, uh, the remaining three hours or four hours. Um, and there's really not much that you learn from just being put in front of a scenario that you're not allowed to really consult anyone, that you can't really talk to anyone about other than your team members. Um, and everything that you do learn by talking to them, you throw it in a script and you're done. Um, and you're also not, there are also strict rules that prevent you from talking to other competitors after the fact. So if you have a friend that did way better than you, you're not supposed to talk to them and uh, learn what things you missed. Uh, with us, I think we have a more lax requirement in terms of not talking to other people and we didn't really. Um, care about whether you talk to someone after the competition because we're not going to reuse anything. So there's definitely more growth and learning here. And everything that we do with our competitions are stuff that we teach in our previous workshops. So just by looking at our workshops themselves, we'll have enough of a basis for someone to compete and learn more during the competition. So people can learn more without having as much of a backing compared to Cyber Patriot. That's a great answer. Thank you. I, I've been oh. a, a mentor, uh, a cyber patriot. Um, 
I'm not sure about well, the California part, but here it was uh, for many low income schools. That was like the only thing they had. Uh, so, but I wanted to see, you know, if you guys felt for somehow, it seems like you guys have, in my opinion, based on what I hear, um, uh, augmented your technical experience by building this competition. So I just wanted to see what your opinion was about it. I, I get it now. Thank you. Cybersecurity um, is what got me into cybersecurity, so I can't, uh, I mean, that's definitely the reason why I'm here today. Um, but I know that I did not learn anything about cybersecurity after my first year as a participant in Cyber Patriot. I do want to give one recommendation. Um, I think NCL does a lot of things good, and we tend to get a lot of inspiration from their style of challenges. It's that good mix of uh, skills and everything. All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> good thing I got that head nod on being opinionated here. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's that kind of mentality really helps a lot um, where the challenges, you know, you're getting towards something here instead of just running the script as Vinay had said. Uh, I, w I was lucky. I didn't get to participate in Cyber Patriot outside of uh, it being an admin for one of them. Um, but yeah. I, I very much prefer critical thinking and collaboration over just run this script and done. That's that's just not what we do in the field. We don't just do things and then, and we don't set and forget. You know, we, te we specifically teach don't set and forget. And that's what you do in Cyber Patriot. You set and forget. So uh, when I was able to make the transition out of that game, I did it without blinking twice. Uh, and that's what helped leverage this team. Because without it, if we kept to that contest, I wouldn't need an entire team to build all these kinds of projects and give them that this experience that they have. You know, go, leaving Cyber Patriot was the best thing because it allowed them to learn so much more. Not only these guys to build stuff, but also the students that they support and mentor got to see things like NCL, Pico CTF, KringleCon, and our own stuff all in the same year. I have a question about all these CTFs, if you don't mind. Um, we also do a couple of the ones you've mentioned, um, but we, I just um, a few of that you did mention that we have not done. So I wanted to hear something of like a rating system in terms of what you think was most useful to you uh, learning. Um, of all your CTFs, and we love NCL, by the way. We do decently, too. Uh, well, Jeremy said we do take inspiration out of NCL. Uh, we've also taken inspiration from KringleCon and Pico. Uh, if I was to rate them, I would say Pico is at the bottom of the food chain, because it is, it is meant to be the easier one of them all anyway, since it is geared to middle school and high school as an introductory game for them. Uh, so we, we've taken inspiration from that. I would say Pico, NCL, KringleCon. Because KringleCon assumes you know already. They, they're, they're, um, the first KringleCon that they did, the first challenge was get out of Vi. So you, you already need to know some Linux. You already need to know how to use things to play that game. So that, that's definitely not a Pico level, you know, an entry level game. You need to know how to use Linux to get out of that first challenge and be able to proceed with the rest. Uh, so I, yeah, those three specifically, I would rank that way. Hey, Google. Thanks. I think just a small comment on that would be just like, even just trying to make your own CTFs. Um, I think that would be slightly more beneficial than just doing a CTF that somebody made. You'd be learning a lot more. The students would be learning a lot more. Um, and then you can just like walk them through like, oh, how do you do this? How would you hide this? Or, um, and then having them host the CTF themselves, like that's big in itself. Well, that was the context for my question because I think that's like where we're going next, right? Okay. How do we create our own challenges? What do you think is most helpful? Um, is it too hard to ramp up from like, you know, NCL or would you start at Pico? Do, do you get what I'm saying? To then be able to create your own challenges and host them yourself. So I would, I would recommend start with Pico and see if you can remake their questions. And then do the NCL gym. Can you remake their questions? Because that, that's what this team did is they looked at those questions they they uh, theorized how they're made, 
and then made their own versions of them. And then from there branched off and did their thing. Uh, we we make a lot of CTFs and it's it uh, I think to this team now it's just second nature. Oh, we're gonna make a CTF, okay, and just start start doing that. But that's what we started with was looking at how does somebody else do it? Can you do the exact same thing or something really similar? And then get inspiration to continue being creative and creating questions on your own. I would highly suggest make your own CTF because I, I always tell everybody, yes, we have in our contest, we have a first, second, third place winner, but the true people who learn the most are the ones who made it. And that would be this team. Uh, I do have one more thing to add on to that as well. Uh, play play video games. There are certain ones, especially uh, TIS 100, I know are using, what was the assembly one with the floating brain that you uh, like a lot, Irvin? Uh, Squally, something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, I absolutely adore Hack Mud, which is a bit of an older one. Um, and that's command line only. Sadly, it's built around JavaScript, which uh, continuing to be a bit opinionated here, not so fond of. <laughs> um, but it's this command line only like MUD, which is multi-user dungeon. Um, it has these inbuilt challenges. It's built off of like a cyberpunk 80s era internet or maybe 70s era. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. And like I, I feel myself getting a lot of inspiration around that. Um, as I said, one of our challenges was like, how do I make how do I make Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild? but with a computer network that the students have to explore through and kind of still follow those gameplay philosophies of learning more about where they are, what they're doing, acquiring more tools and stuff. Um, yeah, and it's, for me at least, that's something where I come from, but I also spend way too many hours playing video games, so I just can't pull my head out of that space. So uh, take it either way, I guess. Hey, the original hackers were, were hacking games. That's what they did, so yeah. Thanks. And if there's something unofficial you want to do, you can do like try hack me as well. Um, you can also make your mini versions of try hack me and submit them to try hack me and then uh, you can have other people play them. Yeah, I really liked uh, some of the try hack me challenges as well uh, to go off of the uh, F Society poster. Um, I, there, there were a few of the Mr. Robot ones, which I, I felt really cool all sitting there clacking away. Cause it was also just like, get to this step, gets to this step, gets to this step done. And you're kind of left open to it at that point. Um, but yeah, that's it's fun stuff. <laughs> I have another question. I feel like I'm just, I'm just going to keep asking questions. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so, Irvin, you said that it was easy for you to get, um, I guess, uh, support for this program. Uh, do you have any advice for people who might be facing some resistance? Um, it wasn't easy to get it off the ground. It was easy once I had I had proof that it worked. Because the like the biggest thing that I had was getting out of Cyber Patriot getting out of that shadow and this, this 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 crazy idea of doing capture the flags and making our own games is that better is that more successful will students cling on to that more than just sticking to cyber patriot i had to prove that and it took a while because we started in 2016 it wasn't until 2018 yeah 18 that we that we broke off so it took about two years to break away so it, it took a lot of demonstration, a lot of tests, a lot of uh, trial and error to get to that point where where the region basically trusted me enough to go off uh, on my on my tangent that ended up bringing these folks to the front. Uh, so yeah, I would say um, demos. I would say trial and errors. I would say getting getting groups of people together to make CTFs for other people. So for example. Uh, making a game for your local high school or high schools and inviting them over. So you're, you and your team build a CTF and it doesn't have to be a difficult one. It can be a very simple one. And, and then inviting them over and teaching them how to play and, and showing them, you know, things like that will help build that rapport and help build that, oh, this is something serious. This is something that can be done. And then slowly but surely it will grow. 
I, cool. I'll give credit where it's due because I again I had Denise to help me with with the administrative and operations side because again I can do all the technical easy, but I also you know I I also need a partner to help me talk to the uh, to the other folks who help make those decisions and together we've expanded this as as far and wide as we have. Okay, so then really, Denise, you were responsible probably for getting like the IT team on board, not not the students. I mean, like IT at school who's probably hesitant because, oh my God, you're gonna be doing all these no, things on our boxes or near our boxes. With, she helped me with like the deans, with with the deans, with the VPs, with, with uh, the uh, workforce development boards, with those people. No, I think they would talk to me or if they would talk to her, she would send them my way. And the, and the way that we we got around IT was building our, our guacamole infrastructure, where I, I could ensure them, our, the students aren't touching your machines. They're not doing anything on your local machine. They're doing something on the cloud outside of your, outside of, of your stuff. Yeah, we were never friends with IT. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of the starting Ever since that, that we had. Ever, if I may interject one moment, sure. uh, ever since that one fateful day when I almost murdered NetLab. Oh yeah. So yeah, we, <laughs> we had used their facilities for some things, but I think what really allowed us to like get off the floor was we had our own subnet that was like a little lab environment. And, and that was where I did my first little run with Irvin uh, for the Cyber Patriot stuff because that was all compartmentalized. It was a way they didn't have to worry about it. Um, and then from there we, you know, with added funding, we were able to move to the cloud and, and just keep it completely divorced from whatever the school wanted IT to, to keep control of. Um, and then, you know, that exponentially improved and increased over time. I love that advice. I think I'm going to circumvent my administration as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Urban here, is here for, literally, just breaking the rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bending, like bending. We're nearly <laughs> testing their flexibility. <laughs> yeah, I need to flex those like GCP skills anyway. Uh, there's a question. You guys have labs coded out that others can use as a template. Uh, we rely a lot on things like uh, NetLab, where things are pre-built, or uh, Try Hack Me. We point students a lot to to uh, Burp Suite, to uh, uh, various systems that again are all on the cloud. Uh, our labs are more of a jump box to help students, because again, one of the biggest problems that we that we have seen with our students is they have a machine that they can't do anything with that. Their, their user is completely locked down or they're on a Chromebook or you know they can't access certain sites because of the network firewall, all of the above. So our, our jump box essentially helps them get to anything that, that we build. So for our major contests, when we can build complete infrastructures, they can use that jump box. You know, they can bring their school issued computer, use that jump box to access our stuff and go from there. Yeah, what I was referring to is just basically, you know, the whole uh, network that you built up in the cloud. You have that some, you know, some sort of cloud formation template if it's Amazon or, or I don't know what you guys do it on, but something that others could use as a starting point. Not have to kind of recreate everything from scratch. Uh, kind of, but not really. Uh, sometimes we have image templates for. Uh, whatever we're doing, if we use it frequently, we tend we haven't used Terraform in the past. That might be something we can do in the future. Uh, but for the most part, our infrastructures are used for three days. So we pull it up manually, and then we're done with it. So we don't really yeah. invest time into doing Terraform or anything else like that. That makes that. sense. And it's usually just a few boxes, right? It's not a whole lot. A lot of them yeah. are in. So. Our that infrastructure itself is usually only like two or three boxes. There's been, I think, one exception to that. Uh, and then our students use GuacBot to request their own instances. Yep. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes definitely sense. can get a bit big. That was fun opening up oh. GCP over summer camp and seeing a hundred VMs in our in our uh, GCP uh, cloud compute engine stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, that was another massive reason that the guac bot was so helpful. It's because, again, being there for the summer camp, it was really hard to manage 120 different VMs that were all very necessary to do with the different sections of the camp. Uh, and also, it's it's not cost effective. Uh, we needed to provide the students with access to these things, but we were on a budget and and we only had so many hands to take care of it. So, you know, the the improvements with our infrastructure, not to say we didn't have any infrastructure before, I, I think were huge. Yeah, I wanted to add on to that. I mean, I'm just trying to give like everybody here some kind of like leniency just because we had like maybe like two or three months to get all this up from up and running into the cloud. So we're all in a rush because right after COVID had started, we needed to figure out what to do, right? So there were some like like cost efficiency issues, um, but we would have needed more time for that. Yeah, like most people, the switch over uh, when the pandemic started was uh, gave us all a, a brand new challenge of how how do we do what we normally do completely cloud based and and though we were already transitioning into the cloud that really pushed us over the edge to not only provide our our training materials that we normally do our resources but also think future wise so build for the present and the future at the same time uh to keep supporting our entire program and they did it they did it wonderfully couldn't have uh, but I have asked for more out of this team. Awesome, guys. You guys are heroes in your own right. I know it was a hard transition for everyone. And um, congratulations, Erwin, and your team here. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, Rod, do you have anything else that you want to add? Uh, no, I wanted to thank you guys for your time today and for the amazing work. I, I'll give you compliments for it. Um, I encourage you to continue doing this. You know, like just whatever you go, create your group, pass it, pass it forward. That's that's usually what I tell people. Uh, once you you're in an organization, like for example, this is it's very. Um, I think it's amazing what what uh, what Irvin has achieved and you guys have achieved. Uh, pass it forward. Uh, there are other uh, people in need of uh, help uh, from individuals like you. So don't stop up your job. Um, you know there are there are organizations like uh, what we have right now like here, Pacific Hackers or whatever you go, uh, join it and uh, continue helping others. So um, this is pretty amazing. Thank you. I hope I'll see you at DEFCOM. Maybe we can play and win. <laughs> That was good. Thank you, Rod, for having us today. Of course, anytime, anytime. Uh, this will be published under the Pacific Hackers um, YouTube channel. Um, I think we have one more meeting before DEF CON, and it's going to be like a CTF. And um, after that, uh, if you guys are not on Discord, in Discord, there's a Vegas 2021 channel where everybody is already um, uh, <clears throat> getting together and planning for DEF CON. Uh, so please join us now that you guys are all going to join the workforce. Uh, you will find a lot of uh, like-minded people, and uh, um, I hope you, you, you like it. Marco, is yeah, that, you is have awesome. anything? <laughs> And uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Erwin and, and team for, for everything, awesome presentation. I miss, you know, a part of it because I have to go to the store, but, you know, I was able to catch up with, you know, most of it. And, uh, but yeah, it's great stuff that you guys are doing. And, you know, uh, again, you know, keep, keep up the good work. And just like Rod said, uh, you know, if you need help, you know, reach out. Uh, and, you know, if you're in Vegas, Let's let's see if we can play together so oh. possibly win. Who knows? We always, we always we always meet up and um, try to strategize, right? You can't play everything. There's there are teams, there are people already preparing to do what, what we're talking about. 
and like I think it was Jeremy that said, you know, usually we um we party too much, so we start playing with the well. We're like, I, I'm not staying overnight playing this. And then we we'll go to party, and then we'll come back. Oh crap, we're fifth and sixth now. So <laughs> it's it's a decision you have to make, right? Uh, but you know, getting a black batch is a big deal. Uh, do you have a, a, a question, Amy? Oh, no, no. I was just saying that I'm going to reach out offline, I guess, about network architecture yeah, um, to see how I can possibly replicate a similar environment. I had not even thought. I don't know why. Like, I have all of these cloud. Like, I, I'm, I know cloud. <laughs> why didn't I think of that? I've had this barrier that, it, you know, with the school administration. And thanks for giving me the idea. Y'all are awesome. Thanks so much. Excellent. Um, let me see. Any other questions? No, I think we're done. So uh, thank you very much again. And uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for giving Bye us guys. the time.